Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you all to video three of the question and answer segment of the sensory processing uh, modules. My name is Fiona O'Farrell and I'm consultant paediatric occupational therapist. Okay, so firstly, what I say is just as we as adults, we need to be mindful of the terminology we use when describing sensory processing difficulties as opposed to sensory processing disorder. Okay, so unless an assessment has been completed by an occupational therapist, I would advise it's much preferable to rephrase the above terminology to, for example, maybe the child who appears to the sensitivities to noise. So more describe what you're actually observing. And we try to refrain from using the diagnostic terminology unless the child's occupational therapist has advised following an assessment. For our children then who present with sensitivities to noise, the first place is to start is through observation, i.e. observing, does the reaction to noise impact on the child's functioning within the preschool environment? We all have sensitivities to various different sensory information, but the key is, is does it impact on our daily functioning? It is also important to note, is the reaction to noise actually appropriate to the developmental level of the child? Also note the time of day, i.e. towards the end of the day, children will naturally going to be tired and will therefore have a tendency to become overwhelmed much more easily. Consider other factors such as, did the child sleep last night? Did they have a good night's sleep? If not, they'll be overtired and this will impact on their tolerance and overall functioning. In observing, you will gather valuable information which will help you build a profile of the child you're concerned about. This information will also be extremely valuable for the child's occupational therapist who will be assessing if this is warranted. So when you do observe a pattern where a child appears to react sensitively to noises to the point that it impacts on their behaviour or ability to participate within the preschool environment, I would recommend the following. It's important again to take a step back and consider, are you including specific regulating body movements throughout the preschool day? This is the first point to start. A body which is deregulated, disorganized, will have more difficulty coping with any additional demands from the environment, such as a sudden loud noise, or noises from other children, or the pitch of the noise. When the body is regulated, it is much better able to cope with any additional demands on their sensory system. Consider the environment. Do you have a quiet, calm space for a child to remove themselves to if they're feeling overwhelmed? However, a young child will not have the ability to remove themselves when they're feeling overwhelmed. So this is where you, through your observations, will then be able to help the child remove themselves to a quiet, calm space before becoming totally overwhelmed and distressed. When a child becomes distressed, it's going to take much longer to help him or her to re-regulate themselves to the point where they can re-engage again. For the quiet, calm space then, consider a quiet room if possible off your main classroom, if this is possible. If this is not possible then, a quiet corner that is free of all distractions, a darkened tent, some cushions to help maybe a favorite toy. Let the child dictate when they are ready and able to re-enter the classroom environment, as opposed to you setting a time limit on it. Before expecting the child to re-engage, help them to reorganize their body through a specific program of regulating body movements outside of possible before any re-engagement with tasks. Remember to speak in a low voice yourself and when you can help the child prepare for any noises that they find distressing. For example, the fire drill, you know, talk about it beforehand, practice the routine, model some coping mechanisms as a part of the preparation. For example, some deep breathing exercises, etc. If you know a particular noise would impact on a child, plan to remove him or her before the noise occurs to a quieter area of the room with less stimulation. Be aware of other additional stimulations on a child who becomes overwhelmed easily. For example, lots of wall pictures, which are stimulating for the visual sense. More neutral wall then is easier to cope with. 
lighting in the room, maybe dimming the lighting may help. For example, even the bright sun coming in through the windows can overwhelm that visual sense. Okay, so the first thing again is be mindful of you as an adult, your expectations as per developmental level of the children in your preschool setting. For example, how long are you expecting them to sit, attend and focus for? Take time observing your children and when they begin to fidget, etc., do you expect them to still sit and attend and listen, for example, during story time? Or do you recognise this as a cue that the child is becoming deregulated and no longer able to engage? Is the preschool day guided more by an, ad an adult curriculum agenda, for example, the specific times of the day, or is it based on the needs of the children in terms of expectations around ability to regulate and engage for periods of time before they naturally become deregulated and no longer able to engage? Ask yourself, do you place more emphasis on the pre-academic type skills? Or do you place equal emphasis on the need for the development of specific body movements? Often this can be influenced by parental expectations, especially when they're paying for a service. So that can be a difficult one. Okay, so just to remind everyone again about the use of terminology, sensory processing difficulties, not disorder. OK, so always start with reflecting on your own expectations, especially around readiness to sit, attend and focus. Do you incorporate lots of opportunities to help facilitate the young body brain regulate and thus be in a better position to engage appropriately? Ask yourself, do you expect the child or children to sit for the duration of a task, for example, story time? Or do you tune into their cues, i.e. their needs, which are telling you that they're no longer able to engage? Ask yourself, when you do observe these cues, do you see it as a behaviour? Or do you reflect that the behaviour is telling you that the child is no longer able to cope? Ask yourself, what plans do you have in place for when the child or children demonstrate behaviours which are indicating that they're no longer able to engage? How do you reorganize the timetable to accommodate that then? Consider your timetable. Does it include regular opportunities throughout the day for regulating body brain activities? Does the timetable include time away from the busyness of the preschool environment? Okay, so the first piece of advice I would give is to focus on helping all our children to develop good foundations in sensory processing. As I mentioned earlier, all our children's lives have become so much more inactive in a number of ways that the result for many of our children is that they often have not developed the skills to enable appropriate participation and engagement with the preschool curriculum. So I'll be advising all staff because of the very vital role that you all have in educating our young children, is to think more in terms of the positive impact that you can have in helping to facilitate the development of good sensory processing foundation skills. Observation is your key in helping you to identify the children who may be presenting with sensory processing difficulties. Observation of behaviours, the presentation of the child through an observation chart will help you then in that process. You'll also have clear documentation and is more objective for your recordings. Remember when you're using observation skills, also consider what is normal in terms of your expectation for that child in terms of their development. Example, would you normally expect a child to sit for a period of maybe, for example, 30 minutes for story time when they've engaged maybe just before that a, for a tabletop task, etc. So again, that being realistic in terms of normal expectations as per developmental level. Discussing concerns with parents is often very challenging and can be very tricky for all professionals. My best advice for you is not to use terminology in any way which may point to a diagnosis. Okay, so rather use your chart of observation to help you, i.e. how is the child presenting? 
the impact of this on the child's ability to engage and have meaningful, purposeful interactions. Reassure the parents, because you have observed difficulties for the child to engage appropriately, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong with the child. Rather, that with a referral to example, occupational therapy, that help can be in the form of advice or strategies to help the child develop the appropriate skills, which will help set them up then for commencing national school. Also consider, do you as a preschool have an information pack for parents when the child commences the preschool around topics such as, for example, the importance of play, why it's important for development, how it helps prepare a child for high academic skills, because play is a child's work but its value is often overlooked by parents who tend maybe sometimes to believe that the more academic type skills and the focus on that is more important. Okay, so messy play is to do with our tactile system, i.e. our sense of touch. For many of our children who have difficulty processing tactile information, you will see this and how they engage with messy play but also their feeding and their diet can be challenging for these children whose sense of touch is not as it should be. You may also see presentation in how the body responds to touch. Frequently when you explore it with parents, you may hear that they prefer the hugs on their own terms as opposed to being hugged. This can also have implications for the child where maybe children standing beside the child, if they brush up against the child or touch off the child, this can cause distress for the child who has sensitivities to touch. So for our children who experience difficulties with their sense of touch, it is important again to begin to help them at that body level with processing the tactile input rather than focusing just on the hands. Okay, so just let's just take a moment here just and just reflect on the wording of, of this particular question. The last part of the question is it refers to causing harm to fellow children. And the focus at the beginning is totally on the child, i.e. integrating the child. So what I would say to you is kind of rather, I would advise you just to step back and consider your own preschool environment and how it meets the needs of our children who attend your service, as opposed to expecting the child to fit in. For any of our children who are non-verbal and have huge sensory issues, they really should be linked in with an early intervention service. And it is for our children, such as non-verbal and sensory processing, your occupational therapy, your speech and language therapy, so that you have individual specific advice. If the sensory issues have not been confirmed by an occupational therapist, I would be advising you to consider some of the following possibilities, which may help explain the child's presentation. There's the possibility of the child being misunderstood because he or she is nonverbal, and this may be leading to the distress and presentation of various behaviours. What accommodations then have you put in place in your preschool setting to help understand the child who is nonverbal and to help them to communicate their needs or wants? And I'd also then be advising you to link in with your speech and language therapist around that as well. Okay, so a sensory room should firstly be a quiet space, free of any distractions, visual, auditory, etc. It's a good idea if you have a little storeroom just off the sensory room, so you can store your various pieces of sensory equipment. So you can incorporate them into the room, depending on the child's individual needs, as opposed to the room becoming cluttered with various pieces of different equipment. A sensory room should also provide opportunities to help the young child's body brain regulate. So pieces of play equipment which facilitate specific large body movements based on a specific program of regulation. A large ball pit might also be useful. Mats with different textures, a darkened tent, cushions, mat again. A bean bag can be very useful. And mats on the floor so the child won't hurt themselves if they fall. And also tend to think of your sensory room in terms of your outdoor space. It doesn't have to just be indoors as well. 
I hope you've all found the modules on sensory processing and the question and answer segments very useful. I hope you've been able to take away some information that you will be able to put in place in your own preschool setting. I hope it helps you understand our children with sensory processing difficulties. And I also hope it helps you recognize the vital important role that you as early year practitioners have in helping our children, all our children develop the good foundations to sensory processing skills. In helping all our children develop the foundations to good sensory processing skills, you are helping to set our children up for those higher academic skills to help them succeed in their later life. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to read the sensory processing modules, for taking the time to submit your questions, and I hope that I've been able to give you information that you all can take away. Take care. Bye-bye.